Thanks, Kathy. Uh, hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here in person. I've been hugged so many times like this week. It's really great. And it's also great to see all these uh, data geeks in the audience. And, and you know, Diego, the number one <laughs> among them. Um, he's done some amazing work. Um, I'd like to really thank Tal Film Canada for being a sponsor of um, this uh, panel, but also for being a huge supporter of the Black Screen Office. Um, we brought together uh, a panel today of um, some really extraordinary people in the industry. Uh, Lindsay Valve, who is uh, the lead re researcher for Quillen, um, she wrote the report with the um, uh, survey data that came from, uh, that we commissioned from Ipsos. Uh, she will be taking us through the research and engaging our two other guests um, who are broadcasters um, with a quite different remit. Um, we have Adam, um, Adam Garnett Jones, who is the director of TV content and special events at APTN. That's the Aboriginal People's Television Network. And Leah Marin, who is the director of development for drama at CBC. I wanted to start out um, by giving you a quote from a woman named uh, Deborah Williams, who um, she runs an organization called uh, the Diamond System, which is used by major UK broadcasters to uh, get a consistent uh, look at diversity data uh, on the programs that they commission for their various broadcast entities. So this is what she had to say. Uh, in the UK and in other places, we don't have an audience segmentation in this way around race or ethnicity or ethnic grouping. So to a large extent, the content that is made doesn't relate to that audience. Looking at, what to, looking at how to represent communities to themselves actually creates an enormous amount of validity and it's actually quite pioneering. I would absolutely take it that the BSO's race-based audience survey is the pioneering edge of this work. So, Lindsay, why is it pioneering? <laughs> uh, so, the collection of race-based data is something that is not super common. It hasn't been in the industry so far. It's something that is improving significantly, but we're still getting a lot better at, and that is very true of audience research as well. So, until now, this data was not being collected, so black, indigenous, and people of color audiences were being absorbed into what we would call a general population of um, audiences that are usually uh, segmented according to broader categories like gender, location, and language. And so right out, out front, this um, research is pioneering in the sense that it disaggregates the data and it collects race-based data on black, indigenous, and people of color audiences and disaggregates those data from ge the general population so that we really get profiles of those audiences independent of, not in comparison to other audiences, but in and of themselves. Um, additionally, this research was done um, as part of kind of a triple set of research that the BSO is leading that tells a more fulsome story of what's happening with um, Canadian content. And so being seen, we learned about the importance of seeing uh, oneself on screen and the, uh, the importance of authentic and representative storytelling. And we saw that was reinforced in being counted when we think of, when we asked black, indigenous, and people of Claudia color audiences about their viewing preferences and their feelings about um, representativeness, uh, the representation on screen. And then the third study that is ongoing right now called Being Black, Black Canadians in the Canadian Screen Industry, which really looks at the pathways to access for um, black creators and black talent. And it kind of gives that other side of who's telling the stories, if, you know, and who's, who's creating what is what we're seeing on screen. Right, so, uh, Lindsay mentioned general population data, which is really all that we have, um, and it's particularly so with audience uh, data. Um, so, Numeris is the company that collects Canadian audience data, and, you know, we've been asking them, why don't you do um, this kind of research that's race-based? And uh, Numeris is owned by the Canadian broadcasters, so we want to know why don't they ask them. So I thought Leah could speak for all broadcasters. <laughs> Thanks, Joan. Um, so I did have this discussion with my colleagues at CBC, and my understanding is that we actually are working with Numeris to, to ensure that, moving forward, that the collection is more inclusive and more transparent. So, you know, 
that's something that I think is being worked on. It's not gonna happen overnight, but I was really happy to know that that is changing, that is shifting. I think what it signals, and I just wanna add this though, is that it is not, I think is that we shouldn't just be reliant on Numeris, and I think there is an opportunity here, and I think we're recognizing that it's important to start working with our partners like Black Screen Office, like Real World, like ISO, you know, to actually start taking a closer look at what is happening with race-based data and figure out how to mobilize beyond that. Great. Um, so, Lindsay, um, the respondents had a lot to say about Canadian content. And as there are producers and writers and other people in the industry here, I'm sure they're curious to know what our, the respondents from the, the uh, survey had to say. Sure. Uh, so a number of really interesting and important findings came out through the research. Um, one of the biggest distinctions that was really important came out, that came out was the difference between diversity and representation. And so diversity was about, you know, the proportion of different characters and, and diverse characters who are viewed on screen. Representation was really about um, the authenticity of the storytelling, the complexity of the characters, how, um, you know, the, the positionality of those characters, who's telling those stories. So there, there was a lot more depth representation and um, participants were very, very clear about this difference and spoke to this difference as as underlying their overall dissatisfaction that they expressed with the representativeness of content available right now um, in terms of Canadian content. Uh, we also saw a lot, uh, a, a large proportion of uh, respondents who preferred streaming services because they could curate their own experiences in that way. Um, and that their engagement with Canadian content was really um, more around a desire to be supportive of Canadian content than it was about being satisfied with, with the content itself. So we see that as a really big opportunity if, if the desire for more representative and authentic storytelling can be met. Oh, one of the things I saw that jumped out at me in the research study was around children's programming. Um, there, there was one question in the survey that asked how important is it for um, children to see people who look like themselves or reflect their racial or ethnic backgrounds. And surprisingly, most, most of the respondents were, yeah, it's important, um, but it wasn't like a major preoccupation. But among the black community, the, the graph shifted like this. It was like, it's really important and it's really urgent. And I've noticed though that in the last few years, it seems that there are fewer um, Canadian um, broadcast network children's programming. Um, what, what did you learn about that, Lindsay, in the report, first of all, and then I'll um, have Lindsay and Adam follow up. Sure. Not Lindsay and <laughs> Leah. <laughs> Leah, Lindsay. <Yeah. laughs> um, so you're right. Uh, children's content was a big concern across the board, and particularly for black audiences. And it was about the power of seeing oneself on screen and the concerns about having uh, stereotypes, negative, negative st stereotypes and narratives being reproduced on screen and, and the power that that would have in shaping a young person's view of themselves and um, their own potential. And so there was not just um, a great concern, but a great sense of urgency that really came through both in the survey and, the, and the inter there was a qualitative component to this research as well and it came out loud and clear through, through that component as well of um, not just the importance, but really needing to make an urgent change and that that actually really affected um, their choices around what they were viewing with their, with their children. I mean, I think that was part of the report that really resonated with me because it's something I understand. You know, I think growing up, we didn't see ourselves on television. Um, and, and I think we all recognize that television, among being entertaining, it's also, uh, it's, it's therapeutic. It's also how we reconcile our place in the world. So I think it's absolutely important and I think it's something that we need to take a closer look at. Um, I look back, I actually was just thinking about this when I was reading the report and I remember, I mean, growing up, I watched, we watched US programming, we watched Soul Train was what we would watch and then we'd get to see, right, the commercials and then you'd see black people in those commercials. And then I was just, I realized Tanya Williams was one of the few people that was actually on television at the time. Um, and I would watch the polka dot door among other things that she was on because that was how I would see myself. Polka dot door. Yeah, but, but I actually think it's, um, it's, it's really important, and I think at CBC, just looking at that, I think it's, it's, a, it's important across the board. So it's, it's something we're looking at in scripted, it's something that we're looking at in unscripted as well as children's programming. Um, you know, I, I think I said this when we had our first conversation about this, Marion Wright Edelman said, 
You can't be it if you can't see it. And I think we need to reflect that more in everything that we do. I just wanted to point out um, that tomorrow, I feel like I'm working for Banff right now, but there are two, <laughs> there are two um, sessions that are happening that are about making children's content more inclusive. So I do think people should check that out. And I think there's another one that Swin, one of my colleagues, is actually going to be participating in as well that takes a look at children's programming in general. So I think it's a conversation we need to keep having. I'm really glad the report highlighted it. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad we're all here. And thank you for inviting us to speak. I just wanted to say uh, the panel tomorrow morning is it's another being seen uh, study. It's uh, it's about uh, commissioning children's content and it's uh, sponsored by Shaw Rocket Fund, who who by the way uh, commissioned uh, an entire report specifically on children's programming, uh, which is a sub report from uh, in, in the being seen um, companion of um, actually pantheon of reports, I should say, Adam. Sure, I just wanted to say that for, I mean, representation for APTN is, it's the reason for APTN to exist. It's the baseline for everything that we do. Um, and so when it comes to children's programming, then we you know, do our own research into our audiences and find out what our audiences find is a real priority and where the missing pieces are um, from our communities. And, and something that we've, we've heard from a lot of parents is that they really want the programming, you know, of course, to carry um, visual representations of, of indigenous people, culture, um, but really it's, it's about language. And so, you know, something that we're really focusing on is um, programming for children and for young people that is gonna be focused on language acquisition, language retention, that can also be used for older language learners um, in that kind of an educational and, and language reclamation context. I think it's hard to um, explain to people that, um, just going back to black content, that having black American content for children on Canadian television is not the same thing. Like, we're not black Americans, we're black Canadians, and uh, there's a whole difference in, in uh, culture, the makeup of our uh, country, and the lived experience. So I, I just you know, want to reiterate again, I think this is a, an opportunity for producers in the room to think about um, what, how they can fill that really pressing need. Um, so I wanted to um, ask about quality content. There seem to be some really interesting views about the importance of quality. Lindsay, can you expand on that? Sure, so that goes back to that idea of diversity versus representation. And uh, participants in this study were really, really clear about, you know, they acknowledged that a lot of uh, that progress had been made and they shared appreciation for those efforts. And at the same time, we're saying that um, it's not enough just to have more people on screen. It is really, really important that we're not simply deferring to um, kind of old tropes and stereotypes and negative ideas. Um, and we really need to look much more at the quality of character development and the storylines being told and um, you know the, pers the, the entry points of those storylines in terms of whose perspective is being um, privileged and prioritized. So what can producers learn from this report? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to take that on? I'll start with being not a producer or anything myself. Uh, <laughs> but in terms of, so in addition to, of course, you know, having insight into the kinds of content that need to be created directly from those audiences and really having a clear sense of who needs to be telling those stories is, um, I think it gives some direction as to the operational and systematic changes that need to be made in order to facilitate that authentic storytelling. Because it's not enough simply to say, oh, we need this kind of content on screen. We need to be much more thoughtful and critical about um, the decision makers who are making those choices and the people who are telling those stories. And so I think it gives um, direction into the structural changes that are needed as well from a producer's perspective. I think just going back to the, the previous question about quality, I mean, so much of quality comes from that writing and, and the research that that writing is based on and the, the involvement and depth of the, the involvement in community that, that, those, that those writers have um, and the experience that they're speaking to. And, and so I think just to kind of dovetail with, with this question for producers, um, what producers can take from it is, is a knowledge or a, a reminder that um, good writing is, 
and good character writing is really deeply researched. It does come, come from the community and that audiences know the difference. You know, that they, they can tell the difference between that idea of diversity and representation. And if all you're doing is just changing up your casting a little bit, and also if you're not giving, uh, this is for broadcasters too, if you're not giving the, the producers the time they need to develop their con content and do that research and connect to community and make sure that the stories are grounded and, and nuanced and exciting and really representative, then that's all you're gonna get is, is that idea of, of diversity and you're never gonna get to that, that representation that, that everyone recognizes on that really gut level when you see it. I think that was the distinction that I really appreciated in the report itself and I think it's, you know, I think it's foundational. I actually really hope that when this is read, it's not just about opportunities that are being made for telling diverse or representative stories, but that people really think deeply about what this report is stipulating what it's saying um, and about the way in which they work, which is what I think you're speaking to. Mm -hmm. I think there it requires a, a shift in, in the way in which we've worked um, to, to create content um, and the way in which we collaborate. So that's, that's my hope. Well, CBC is doing a lot of work, like we saw in the session this morning. There is, uh, seems to be a big effort uh, to make um, in inclusive content, but the, it doesn't seem to be connecting with the audience yet. And so my question to you is like, without the data, how do you connect um, what might be your key audience to some of the really exciting new projects that you're developing and producing? So I think, I think the main point to make is that we're not solely reliant on Numeris. We're not waiting for that information and that, that data to come through. We've been doing that work ourselves. So in addition to having internal teams that are doing the research, so we are doing deep dives on everything that we produce. So we do research and we actually are reaching out to audiences to understand how they're responding to our, our content. We are oversampling with BIPOC communities to, to make sure that that's properly represented and that we are truly doing our homework. Um, I think beyond that, we're also working with external partners as well um, to, to actually take a look and focus solely on BIPOC communities and understanding, you know, much like what the report has looked at, you know, what are they consuming? What are they like? What is lacking in the content that is out there? And, and all of this information comes back to all of us in various teams to, to help us figure out the strategy about how to best move forward. So um, there's, there was a difference between black, indigenous, and people of color. There was, they were not a monolithic group, um, uh, which shouldn't be surprising. Um, but um, Lindsay, what did you find was some, some of the key differences? Uh, actually, one of the key differences that I think is worth highlighting is that, as you mentioned, you know, in particular for black audiences, there was this deep, deep concern and sense of urgency around um, children's content and really, really high levels of dissatisfaction with the representativeness of content on screen. In contrast, um, the people of color audiences, a large proportion of whom identified as uh, South, South Asian and Southeast Asian, um, and and reported um, pursuing kind of viewing content that was in a language other than English and French and viewing content that was from either their country of origin or their parents' country of origin tended to actually report slightly less dissatisfaction. And so this really kind of pointed to the idea that they were able to curate um, an experience, a, a viewing experience that was more representative for them by sampling from markets that were, estab that were established elsewhere. So, you know, Bollywood and that sort of thing. Um, that, a lot, that really shifted their experience of, of how satisfied they were with the storytelling that was happening. What can we do with that information? That's probably a Leah question, an Adam question. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, uh, looking, looking at, at, at the, the data, and it's not, it, you know, the, not, not to say that the, the, the data is inadequate, but I mean, for, for APTN, we do you know, much more robust uh, information gathering on indigenous audiences, and we break uh, audiences down into, you know, age and gender and Inuit, Métis, First Nations. We do sur surveys in um, English, French, Inuktitut. Uh, several times a year because really the numbers that, that we get from Numeris have almost no bearing on our, on our audience, certainly not our indigenous audience because there's, there's no Numeris set-top boxes in indigenous communities. I think there's something like of the, the sample areas that Numeris collects data, 
uh, less than 14% of the country's indigenous population even live in those areas. So we really rely on our own, our own research and, and connection with audiences to, to try to figure out um, what we need. But I think it's, it echoes what I said earlier, which is I think we use the data. I think we use the data to inform, I think, how we therefore think about the programming that we're creating, who we're reaching, and what makes sense and how we move forward. It helps to build, it will help in building a strategy about how we program in the future. So uh, Leah and out of your new hires to your uh, companies, um, there seems to be a rush to hire people like you, <laughs> who look like you. Is, is that the solution? <laughs> I have, who, who was it in, in another session earlier today? I think um, somebody was quoting Marcia Nickerson talking about uh, indigenous pathways and protocols and talking about how the work is about uh, repetition, 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 and coming at these problems from all kinds of different angles. I mean, I think that, yes, of course, hiring from as many different diverse communities as possible is, is a, a huge part of the equation but it's, it's only part of it. I mean, I think we have to look at the ways that we are, are, are working. We have to look at the ways that the, the production industry itself and the ways that we make content are unhealthy and, and rely too much on the, the laws of the land and, and, and they don't relate enough to um, the communities that we're working in and, and we don't honor those, those relationships with, with the communities that we're working in very often, I think, as, as, a, as a production community. And I think that there's all kinds of different parts of that equation. And, and, but by thinking about all of it and attacking it from different angles simultaneously, it keeps the conversation active and it means that people can find different places for themselves to contribute and, and, and do the work. What he said. Like I, <laughs> I mean, I think that's exactly it. I think, I think it's part of it. I think, of course, we want to see more diversity in terms of the hires and the people that are making the decisions, um, key strategic decisions. But I also think it's, it's exactly as Adam said. I think there's a lot more research. I mean, the BSO seeing this with all the reports that you're doing, with all of the, I think, you know, um, examination that still needs to happen with all the conversations that are ongoing. And so I think we have to look at it from many different angles. And I don't think we've actually figured it all out yet. I think there's still a lot more to be done. Um, and, and I think we keep working toward that. But it's just, it's a, a tiny piece of the puzzle. There's so much more. And ultimately, it's, I think it's about, it's about making meaning, you know, making content that is deeply meaningful to people that connects with, with audiences in, in ways that people are gonna really care about. I know, I mean, I've, I've worked at Telefilm and, and CMF and, and different places and I've been a, a, a producer and I feel like a lot of conversations are about um, different audiences that are being served in different ways and, and trying to get different kinds of content made and, and talking about serving communities of producers and broadcasters and, and all of these, these different pieces, but ultimately, a lot of these conversations boil down to how we're serving the audience and how we as people whose job it is to make entertainment, make education, make meaning of the world, how well we're doing that and, and how we can figure out how to do that better. I think the only thing I'll add to this is you're right. I think, I think we're still also talking about it though almost in silos because we're talking about niches as we talk about black, indigenous and people of color. We're talking about what meets certain needs. I actually also believe there's connective tissue in all of this together. So I actually believe in the fact that you're right, it has to be meaningful, but I actually do believe we start to learn how to exist and connect and be a society as a collective by actually having this content out there. So I think that's also a big part of it. And I think it's important to stratify and break it down in this way, but at a certain point, I'm also excited to just rebuild it. So it's part of a larger continuum. So speaking of rebuilding, I, I never thought that data could be as interesting as it was doing this study. It's like, I'm not a data geek, but I'm, I'm getting there. Um, what, what we found in doing it was that the methodologies that are out there that you know, are commonly used really did not fit what we were doing. It was almost like we had to imagine and think about an, a new approach. And um, Lindsay did an amazing job at this. She has a very, very deep, deep understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so she really helped uh, steer the direction of 
the research, but what we, I'll, but what did you discover um, in doing that? So I'll, I'll mention a few things. Um, I think fundamentally the big lesson is that, and both um, Adam and Leah, you, ju you just mentioned this, is that there is a systemic, there is a need to look at the systems and processes in place because of how embedded certain practices are, even inadvertently. And so that was true of the research as well. And so often we look at research as this kind of objective, like, oh, we can trust the methods. And that wasn't true at all. And so, you know, Adam, earlier you mentioned set-top boxes and the fact that uh, numerous set-top boxes are not in, in places where uh, indigenous populations are, are, are living. And so we needed to look at those. So we did surveying as well as um, a qualitative component that was using a proprietary um, interview sort of platform that allowed individuals to do kind of these diaried responses but allowed an interaction between the interviewer and the participants to really go much more deeply into um, their responses and their choices so they weren't, that we weren't making inferences about audiences that quite frankly we don't know because we have never actually um, asked them in any way that was that allowed for a profile to be constructed. So really looking just at, at the outset of how this was constructed to make sure that we were using methodologies that would access as many people as possible um, in a way that fit their schedules, in a way that wouldn't be inhibitory. Um, based on you know, needing certain technologies or things like that. Um, Leah, you mentioned oversampling, and, and I totally agree. We also needed to do some of that for, for this research. And what I will say, it's, it's considered oversampling when you think about what often drives the sampling, which is the census, which in and of itself has its biases and barriers. Um, but when you think about it as this research was really meant to profile black, indigenous, and people of color audiences. so. Getting as many audience members to respond as possible is not oversampling because the sample that you're thinking about is the total population of black, indigenous, and people of color in Canada. So all, the, all we did was to, instead of using the census as the benchmark, we just said, okay, let's, let's focus on these audiences. And in that case, it just meant really leaning into getting participation from those audiences. So that was a really big difference as well. And then the third thing that I'll mention is in the reporting. And so, um, there is this tendency to desire to compare against general population. And when general population is comprised primarily of white audiences, it drives a certain kind of comparison as if the general population is a benchmark. The purpose of this research was not to, to be comparative in that way, but to really highlight and, and um, profile black, indigenous, and people of color audiences in and of themselves. So it wasn't, this is important compared to, or this matters because, no, this matters because these are these audiences' experiences. And it was really, really important that in the reporting, that is the direction that we took, rather than using some other benchmark from previous data. I found that one of the most important things in the research, too, was it was that automatic knee-jerk reaction to say, okay, we're do gonna do a study. <clears throat> so what, does, what do all these different um, underrepresented groups think compared to the white audience? And it was, it was, it was striking like at, at first because when we looked at the first set of, of charts, it, it, was, it ended up that the study was like half white when, the, when what we were asking for was a profile of black indigenous of people of color. And it just, it was, like a, a big mind shift that, that had to happen because as Lindsay said, this has never ever been done before. And we discovered with talking to Nielsen and some of the companies in the UK that it's actually not being done anywhere in the world. So this is again, going back to the idea of pioneering. And we just think that it's, uh, it's really important as a country if we're gonna move forward to really have that kind of depth of knowledge of really a quarter of our population. Um, so, um, we have some time for questions. There's one in the back. Hi, thanks so much. It was really informative information and good to see um, our dear friend Adam. Hey, <laughs> there. Congratulations, both you at APTN now. Really welcome you there. But part of it is also um, corporate culture shift um, because if you're talking about this data that says, yes, our people want to see ourselves on the screen, but we also as indigenous producers, and I would imagine um, black and people of color producers, want to be 
the producers producing that work. And one of the things that's happened in Canada, because for many years, um, these non-Indigenous producers have, have basically garnered significant wealth and significant um, skill and opportunity, and certainly that needs to be recognized. But it seems to be this culture which I see where, well, you can do that, but you have to go with a white company to come to us to be able to get validation or have access to the interim financing um, from the banks or whatever it is, all the sort of systemic barriers that are there right now with all these companies who have had many, many years to work with our people who didn't and now that there's an opportunity, it's like, oh, well, we love black people, or, oh, we love indigenous people, and suddenly they're all wanting to work with us. So how do we, at the same time, say, yes, you're good people, and we thank you for all the good work you've done, and continue to do that good work, and get the broadcasters and the other people commissioning and even the distributors to say, Yes, but we want it authentically from the communities, and we want to build the wealth. We're talking about intergenerational wealth that our people and uh, the people have been denied for, for the decades that this industry has, has d developed in Canada. I was just on the Blue Ant thing. Wonderful people, done great things. They went from fledging to multi-billion dollar industry. So why aren't our people being able to do the same? We're just as capable, we're just as smart, we're just as talented, we have just as many good stories. So it's that culture shift within those, within those organizations, including CBC, who says, well, gee, we're gonna work with different producers. We're not just gonna work with the same producers or these, these producers who maybe we've known before, and yes, we like them, and maybe they can do different things, but let the authentic indigenous, black, and people of color producers come forward so we can build that, um, and not just mentoring, not just training, but actually valid, real producers <coughs> can produce the work to those broadcasters. So it is a culture shift within the industry itself. So I hope I'm not offending anybody here. I work with non-Indigenous people a lot. I have some great allies that I work with and love and will always work with. But it's a real shift within the broadcasters and with, within this world. And I said this many years ago and I got probably why I've been <laughs> ostracized for so many years in this industry. I said, sit down, white people. Just for a little while, I'm not saying forever, just sit down and let us flourish. And um, I'm saying it again, but with love, with kindness, with respect. And if you want to ally with us, then uh, we got to take the lead. And, you know, we welcome that. So, hi, hi, thank you. I didn't hear questions, so maybe we'll... <laughs> I, I think that, just, that was just great. Just to, to speak to that, uh, I think there, we are seeing changes from, from different broadcasters um, and different sides of the industry around that. There, there's some really great conversations this morning about um, the idea of, of scaffolding for some of those. I think that was, that was how it was referred to. Um, uh, agreements where there are producers who are coming in <clears throat> BIPOC producers who may or may not have, have less, ex less experience, if they do have less experience, working with another, with another producer um, and arranging the contracts so that they are, um, oh my goodness, this is not my strength. Uh, so <laughs> basically, so it, it, with the intention that the, the uh, people of color who are coming in to, to lead, they're bringing that story authenticity, um, they're, they're, they're wanting to grow their company, they're working with another production company, but over a period of, of seasons or over a period of time, the other company is kind of growing out of the arrangement and the other company is uh, coming to the, the forefront, which I thought was interesting. Yeah? They were getting commissions and they had less experience and, you know, than, than you know, many of the BIPOC and indigenous producers who, who are bringing things forward now. So that may sound like a good thing, and I agree, it might work in some circumstances, but I really think that there is a systemic change that has to occur. And it has to occur in such a way that all those white producers don't, won't feel threatened, and, and yet at the same time we can have that sort of, you know, you know because we are, I mean, you know, Blue Hand just said, it's a business. Well, we're business people too, and we should have that opportunity to be able to create that business as well. So I think at the CRTC level, I think at the CMF level, I mean, as you know, Adam, CMF literally had to change its policy 
to say that indigenous projects with these 49, 50% things, the indigenous producer controls the distribution, the, mar um, the feature, all aspects of production, because many of those 49% producers were not respecting the 51% producer. CMF literally had to change its policy in order to allow that. So I think there has to be the education, you know, let's not, do we have to wait, I guess is my point. And I think it's time for that kind of shift and the broadcasters to say, yeah, we took a chance with those companies when they were inexperienced, so-called, um, and now what can we do to, to shift that? And I think, I think it's time, really, I think it's time. Anyways, with thank you. I think while we're moving the mic up, I think I just want to though add. To, I think, but I think Adam is saying that uh, that shift is happening, and I think to your point, Loretta, I think agency is key, and I think we understand that. We recognize that for BIPOC producers, agency is essential, and so I think it's we can keep talking about how we do that, how we take risks, how we make it happen. But I guess the the response to what you've said and shared is. Yes, I think we're in agreement. This is the way in which the landscape needs to shift, and, and I think we're going to continue to work together to make sure that happens. Tanya Williams, Real World Screen Institute. Another mind-blowing concept is that black people and indigenous people and Asian people and people of color may not want to make any content to do with their culture or any story to do with that. And then, I hope broadcasters and funders remember that we just want to maybe tell stories maybe about white people <laughs> for a change and that we're not pigeonholed into that I have to bring in a black project to be sort of recognized. So I wanted to make that. That was my question. Um, it's on. It's on. on to Loretta's comment, um, Loretta, first of all, I want to acknowledge you personally. You're, you're a trailblazer for indigenous producers, and I hold my hand up to you. And I'm now with Knowledge Network, and I completely understand your frustration and your desire and your commitment to our indigenous peoples in this industry, and I want to be one of those change makers. I'm now sitting with a broadcaster. I want to achieve the things that you are asking for. Any other questions? Any more sermons? Sorry, was there someone ahead of me? Okay. Hi. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for this panel. I, I did have a question because, you know, as uh, it's a relationship industry, as they say as well, you're building relationships all the time. Uh, and, you know, I, I find that as a writer, producer, content creator, I am speaking with sometimes with broadcasters who don't understand, right, the stories that I've written and they cannot connect and have been honest enough to even tell me on during the pitch, I don't really understand or I don't really connect. And I, I have trouble still asking um, the question that I really want to ask in that situation, which is, in this case, do you work with a consultant or a body of a group of people who are from those communities who understand the value in this story? And I, I, I don't ask because <laughs> of obvious reasons. So I haven't reached that point, and I'm just wondering what advice you have for someone like myself in my position as you're trying to build these relationships. Any tips or advice it would be appreciated? Thank you. Just, just to say, um, I had a meeting this morning with some of the um, broadcasters and leaders in the industry, and uh, they have those same concerns. They're really going through this process of, you know, uh, um, looking very closely at how they commission work, and, like how they can move um, the needle forward, how they can make change. Um, that was really gratifying to me to hear that. But you know, on the ground, it's something that's, it's really hard to do, but I think everybody's grappling with it. And I think if we can do it collaboratively and really speak to each other and be transparent about where we are in the process, I think that you know, we can really change the world. We have time for one more question. I would just, just like to, to respond yeah. to that and, and say, I, I think that that sounds a little bit lazy on, on behalf of the people that you're, you're pitching, maybe. And I think that it's, it's, it's okay to find a nice way of saying, 
it's your job to try to understand. And saying, I don't understand, isn't really adequate, and maybe they need to, to work with a consultant from the community to help bridge that gap, but you know, people are people and stories are stories, and I think if that kind of thing is often used as an excuse to just shut people out of the room and, and, and get them to, to kind of leave and move on to the next thing so they don't have to think about it and do that work. But I think that if you can find a way to nicely say, let me, let me help you to understand because this is really important and maybe we need to have a, a, a 90 minute meeting instead of a, a 20 minute meeting. And, and let me, what, what can I do to help you understand so that you get a really good read on this project and understand how it'll uh, affect your audience and how it might work with, with your portfolio. Um, yeah, I, but, but that's, that sucks, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, I agree with that. I was going to say, ask the question. I, I think you asked it very politely, and I think you were you were absolutely within your right to ask it the way that you suggested it. I mean, I think I agree with that. I also understand the other side of that is also the burden of having to then educate someone, and I get that as well. Um, but I will say this is to Joan's point. I think I think it is the industry just needs to change, and so you know. They are, our teams are getting more diverse and that's a wonderful thing, but we are at CBC, we are working with consultants so that we are actually, I think, filling in the blind spots that we know that we have about certain communities. So I think, I, I'm hopeful that this shift is happening across the board, but we, like this, we need to keep talking about it. Um, before we wrap up, I, I wanna thank um, our funding partners um, who came on board very enthusiastically. We're incredibly grateful. Um, Telefilm Canada, CBC Radio Canada, Bell Media, Course Entertainment, In Spirit Foundation, Creative BC, and Interpublic Group. Um, once again, I, love, I want to thank the speakers for um, diving into this report and bringing us um, these little pearls of wisdom that they found. I think it's an important conversation um, that I hope will continue, and um, we'll keep writing reports <laughs> and doing others.